You're listening to Nakedly Examined Music, a podcast about songs and songwriters. My name is Mark Lintonmeyer. My guest for episode 123 is Rick Kemp, best known for his bass playing and being one of several singers for Steel Eye Span, a band known for giving a rock edge to traditional British folk music. He joined them for their fourth album in 1971. You're right now hearing him sing one of the songs that was recorded for that album, Below the Salt, called John Barleycorn. This version is actually radically rearranged for an album called Present that they recorded in 2002. He played on 15 of Steel Ice Band's albums, running all the way through 2016, but has also recorded five solo albums starting in 1996. We're going to be talking about Race Against Time from his latest Perfect Blue 2018, then looking to his work on the final Steel Ice Band album he was a part of, Dodgy Bastards from 2016. The song is called Cromwell Skull. And looking back a little further to a song called Samhain, that he contributed to Steel Ice Band's 2004 album, They Called Her Babylon. We'll conclude by listening to an old one, Bachelor's Hall, that he fronted for Steel Ice Band's All Around My Hat, 1975. And just to explain a couple of the names that keep coming up here, Maddie Pryor is the lead singer of Steel Ice Band and was long married to Rick. Peter Knight was their longtime violin player, whom I interviewed for Nakedly Exam Music, episode 27. For more information, please see rickkemp.co.uk. For more about this podcast, see nakedlyexaminedmusic.com, or if you want to support what we're doing here, please go to patreon.com slash nakedlyexaminedmusic and sign up for a small per episode contribution. So I will have played a little bit of John Barleycorn, the version from present 2002. We wanted to have a little of that, the classic tunes in there, just to sort of remind folks who Steel Ice Band was, even though that's not the version that's not, you know, it's not the below the salt version from 1972. This is the re recording that you got to sing lead on. I guess, do we want to say just briefly, I don't want to go through many, many years of history, but get us from you were in Steel Ice Band until 2016, although you had already been recording. So this is your fifth solo album, Perfect Blue, 2018. Do you want to say a little about that transition? You know, this race against time is going to be a very, and everything else on that album is. Very different in style from Steel Ice Band. Do you want to say a little bit about where you're at with your solo career and what you're trying to do by this point before we play the song? Perfect Blue, by my latest of five albums, done really to try to, it didn't quite come off, I have to say, but to try and illustrate that I'm now doing things on my own, uh, just doing gigs solo. But having put the voice and guitar down on most of them, I decided it would be, I couldn't resist it. I can't help myself. No restraint at all. So I just put some bass on quite a lot of them and some percussion on some. I even got a couple of people in, I think. Yes, I got a steel player in to play on a couple of the tracks. But it was mainly to try and convey that I'm no longer doing band work, really. I'm just doing solo gigs. That's all that was about, really. We used to sing, we used to play Those season songs of yesterday Telling tales of men and kings Saying sinners and broken rings I was wondering if good would come Of beating more on that beaten drum Oh, was there time to change beliefs When I caught the icy breath of that well-known thief? So close So close to the end So close to the end of this race against Weapons gave concern Pointless passions began to burn Rogues ran out and treaties were signed Hell and handcarts came to mind And worship for the gods of speed Secret plans and mindless greed no power to stem the tide of mankind rushing to the other side. So close, so close to the end, so close to the end of 
this race against time. All we ever had was hope and a story, and the few kind words that got us this far stretch from here to a distant star. So close, so close to the end, so close to the end of this race against time. I said goodbye to those faded years Open the cupboard of new ideas But the tools and book of rules were gone The ones I'd used for far too long So writing the lives of men With silent ink from a cyber pen I clutch my ticket for the ferry ride To the timeless gates upon the other side So close So close to the end So close to the end of this race against time So close to the end of this race against time So very nice, catchy, simple tune. This is not one of them that has a lot of, uh, I mean, I guess there's a little shaker that comes in later, but for the most part, this is extremely stripped down. Do you want to say a little about, I mean, was this kind of the melodic essence that you feel like you were already working with that you're just pairing back to kind of see it exposed? Partly an experiment for my own good. As I say, it didn't quite come off, but I wanted to try and do a voice and guitar album. I'd never done anything before of my own solo in that sense that I'm just by myself. So that came off to a certain extent. Certainly it's a lighter album than the, the first four. And it was just a bunch of songs that were around at the time, with a, a, an exception of a couple of them, which I'd done before. But basically to show that if I was arriving at your place to do something, I'd be just doing it with a guitar. And this song, Race Against Time, had this been sitting around for a while? or That was a brand new one. It was a three-verse, three-stage thing, which I favor most of the time. The first verse, leaving the band to do new things, was the point of that. But realize the shortcomings of leaving the band. That's the first verse. Verse two is an end of life, end of world kind of equivalent, if you like. I'm trying to make a case for the end of my life coming up. <laughs> Looks like it could be the end of the world. No great bundle of laughs, that one. And verse three was just a um, lack of energy and resources that you don't see coming and that you're on your way out. IT is a great mystery to me anyway, and that kind of boldness that you used to have as a youngster, suddenly you're confronted with the same problems, but without the resources and energy to carry them off in the same way as you always did. So that's Race Against Time. I'm quite pleased with that. It's good when that three-verse format happens for me, when it works out the way it was kind of planned. I pulled that one off, I think. It's funny that even though you're not writing in a historical vein in the way that the other songs we're going to talk about, just the fact that you mention these things still gives it that flavor, right? If you're saying we told tales of men and kings, saints and sinners, like that's almost the same in terms of the tone, in terms of what the song feels like as actually putting, you have phrases that are still, you know, would not be out of place in a Steel Ice Man historical. Yeah, when I caught the icy breath of the well-known feet, you know, these very vivid, ancient sounding images. Well, I suppose it rubs off in the end. I think if you do it long enough, if you deal with trad songs long enough, you do pick up that kind of language and that that was what that particular verse was about. Those images creep in almost unconsciously somehow, yeah. And that's basically what the tradition was about, in a sense. You know, those kind of broken token songs and the difference between the upper and the lower all the time in, in social terms. 
and worship for the gods of speed, secret plans, and mindless greed. So yeah, I know in, in a lot of other your your other solo stuff, you've got genocide, you've, you've got this pretty straight ahead social commentary, apocalyptic sounding. Can you say a little more about how that sentiment crept into this thing that's much more personal? I kind of had always, I think, some kind of social conscience. I'm not a great activist in that sense that I'm not keen on doing too many street marches and that kind of thing, but I feel as if I can do my bit in the writing. And I find it comes naturally to me to do things like Phoenix, I suppose, started it. I can't remember which was the first one of that kind of song. But I do feel the forthcoming apocalypse quite strongly sometimes. Well, and right now especially, but I guess we'll see. To twist this back to the song, this so close, so close to the end, so close to the end of this race against time, I love the way that the repetition in there and sort of revealing more and more of the of the phrase and then that pause right before time, that that sort of delayed way of spilling that out. And it's so exultant that it's a song about death, but it's a, a very life-affirming sort of at least musical feeling. Yes, I'm glad you picked up on that. The race against time is really just a way of looking at life, really, I suppose. And being around bands and on the road most of my life, it always seems like that. It always feels like a race against time anyway, just in a very kind of literal sense. You're always in a hurry and there's always a deadline. That seems to work for me for a metaphor for the whole journey, really. Why then is worship for the gods of speed part of the things that are condemned, whereas you'd think if you're feeling honestly like, I better finish this stuff, and it seems there's something ambivalent about that. No, I think worship of the gods of speed is, is just one of those kind of elements which I can see further in the cause of the apocalypse, really. It's the big hurry that we're all in. Well, in fact, one of the most interesting books, I can't remember the author's name, but I heard him speaking on Radio 4 the other day, and it's called Slow Down, and he made a really good case for the fact that everything is moving too fast, and we all know that, but he's got a different slant on it. It's called Slow Down, simply that, but it uh, sounds good. I'm looking forward to that one. Well, yeah, and of course we get the picture of the rat race, the hamster wheel, that it's the speed of industry is not necessarily, it's almost speed for the sake of speed rather than producing something. Like, I'm glad that you produced so many albums over that many years. Do you feel like that it's better now to be able to be creative, not under deadlines, and that, you know, that it's just a completely different dynamic when you're putting together a song? Absolutely. I'm not one to be pressured anymore, but I'm enjoying the relaxed approach to it all, yeah. Having this big space here now, sometimes when you get too much space, it's not always as productive as you'd like it to be because you kind of get into a this kind of laissez-faire or we've got a whole day here, so we'll see if anything comes up. And it doesn't. it's not always the best thing for getting stuff actually on paper, is it? But I've made a, a start on about five, but it doesn't always mean anything. I don't know about other people's way of going about it necessarily, but I get one in three average that works out. Songs that you start? Yeah, one of them will be kind of working for me and the other two usually kind of a lead up to it. It's not the most efficient process. (laughs) Well, then you have two out of three musical ideas that are still floating around to pester you in the future that you can... I still have ones, you know, songs that I'll finish that... This was something that was a failure song from 20 years ago, and now I'm finally using it as a verse for something, just because it has never left me. It sometimes works like that for me, where you get a couple of lines or a paragraph or a verse or chorus that's useful later on, but mostly I can actually identify the two songs that didn't work out and the one that did, that's what I mean. And it's just the way it tends to work for me, is that I have these two or three going at one time, and but the average useful one to record is about one in three, and two fall by the wayside usually. Well, it seems that was probably a useful attitude to have in your former band. Let's move to Cromwell's Skull from the last Steel Eye Span album that you were on, Dodgy Bastards 2016, because yeah. I see, you know, it's not like you, with, with so many writers in that band, and such a dedication to traditional material such that original songs are not necessarily going to take priority or they would have to have a certain tone. Say a little about this, you know, this is an original song, but it's written, you know, like many of the Steel Ice Band original tunes in that it could be a traditional thing or it could be using historical, there's definitely historical research going on here. 
What we hope is that it becomes a traditional song quite often. Ah. <laughs> you wonder if in 50 years' time somebody's kind of singing it as history. I've always been interested in historical figures, and I did Montrose. It was the longest track we ever recorded. The Earl of Montrose, he was an interesting character. Cromwell was just dying to be done, but mainly because his skull had a more interesting life than he did. And I thought it was an interesting enough angle to write. I was fascinated by the story when I first heard about it. Do you like it? Does it work? I do. Let's play it. I will warn listeners that it's eight and a half minutes, but it's worth it. And it's a, just mostly a nice vamp that fills it out at the end. It's not like it's really eight minutes of material. The Flash players in the band uh, didn't know when to stop at the end. <laughs> Plan for any 
rags hang in silence around fallen Is this in six four? <laughs> what this this verse? I wasn't exactly sure what. There are just some extra beats. Straight fours, I think. Okay. I th- there may be the odd beat missing in the odd bar, but uh-huh. I think generally speaking, it's just four four. Yeah. Yeah. So how did you know? Like for instance, this main theme that the violin is playing at the beginning, the guitar plays it at the end. Is that part of the melodic content that is there? Did you demo this first? No, I think we just started playing it live before the album. We, I think we'd probably played it once or twice live, but I'm not really sure. I can't really remember. I've been out of the band nearly for four years, so details like that are beginning to disappear. That's totally fine. I guess I didn't even know for, for this one. It seemed like was everything, as far as the writing credits, 
attributed to the group, sort of no matter who actually wrote what, or I just didn't see in the liner notes where I was looking any distinction. It's one of those bands which you write it, but you share it with the rest of the bands. The credits usually read something like Kemp or Pryor or whatever, or Peter Knight, Stroke Steeline. It's got this egalitarian kind of look about it. <laughs> sure. Well, that's nice for financial reasons to keep people from quitting. What does that mean like for this song in terms of, again, that main theme that the violin starts to play? Is that something that Jesse May Smart improvised? Or was that something that was, you know, you're basically humming as the, oh yeah, this is, we have this intro theme before the verses come in and then the verses go like this. You know, how are you presenting this to the band? I probably just play it with the guitar, which is what I usually do, because that's the only thing that I play, apart from the bass, of course, but I don't play that anymore. But I just sing it to them uh, simply with the chords, and if I've got any fixed arrangements, then I'd make them known, and they do what they will, and that's how we've usually approached it. But it's been a long haul and lots and lots of lineups, so different lineups have done things slightly differently. You've interviewed Peter before, and Peter's usually fairly straightforward about what he expects and what he wants, but uncharacteristic of the band, I think. Most of us just take the song in and let everybody kind of do what they would like to do with it. Sure, and especially as the bass player, there's a lot of room for other people to do things, whereas if you were the lead guitarist or something, then you're, I think, just by the nature of the arrangement process, you're already taking up more space, and so it kind of governs what other people can do, how, how much space they have. You have to trust everybody in a band like that because they're usually very good players. So if they've got something to say or they like, it's a comment on what they think of the song. If they want to play or like all that flash stuff at the end that they play, I take that as a compliment, really. You created a good vamp progression for them to just keep going on. And if they've got something to say for that long, then I assume that it's suiting them. I'm much more, I would say, much more a lyricist than I am a musician. I don't know a great deal about music technically. I'm not a technician, but I kind of know what I want, if you see what I mean, cordially. It's a trustworthy band. You know, most people that have been in the band have been excellent players, all of them, in fact. I can't think of one that wasn't. So as a writer, if you've got your writing hat on in that band, you can actually kind of trust them all to kind of do something tasteful. Well, let's drill into some of the lyrics here, because I, I mean, when you're getting to no rigid mind, no half a heart, just flesh and bones upon this cart as my resurrection starts, that God in heaven judge my part. What, what is this overall story? There's strange things happening here, but you were saying this is from the his, sort of historical story of what happened with Cromwell's skull. Can you say a little more about how you received that and what made it into the song? He was buried a hero. His grave was for three years in Westminster Abbey. Now, Westminster Abbey is where you bury royalty. And he nearly, very, very nearly was, of course. He nearly was the king, as it says in the chorus. The bodies were exhumed when they were discredited. In the end, him and his two pals, John Bradshaw and Henry Ireton. So all three of them were buried there. They were then, after the interregnum and, and the accession of Charles II, resurrected, dragged to Tyburn, tried again, and hung, drawn, and quartered. Totally futile exercise, but that's what people certainly here were like then. <laughs> and so his skull was put on a post for something like 23 years outside Westminster Hall. The myth is, it's myth or legend, the fact that there, there are a few gray areas, but the skull blew down after 23 years and picked up by one of the 24 seven centuries and taken to his house in Cambridgeshire. His daughter spotted it for a money earner, I think was how it went. And they sold it to a Cambridgeshire family who sold it on and then it was sold on again. Then it was lost for a while. Then it was sold on again. And the provenance of the skull is almost complete. And then in 1966, when it surfaced again for sale, his old college, which was Sydney Sussex College in Cambridge, he was only there for six months. He wasn't a learned man in that sense, but they decided enough was enough and that they buried it. And only six people, I think, were privy to the knowledge of the place where it was buried. And that still remains to this day. There are only a few people who know where it's buried because the same old stuff would happen again. It would be sold on and auctioned and blah, blah, blah. It gives me a good story for my solo because I take it out into fiction land as well as a story, as an introduction to it on the solo gigs. 
So the skull is bought and sold and buried and, and resurrected for years and years and years until 1966 when it was finally put to rest in Sydney Sussex Gardens. As listeners, you know, what makes this still Steel Ice Ban is, oh, it's historical. It has these, again, it's mentioning castles somewhere in there. It has some religious language. So it all kind of gets lumped together, but it's completely different centuries. The history you're writing here goes up to the 1960s. That, that's pretty great that you can have something that still sounds with that historical gravitas, but that was not written in the 1600s. Actually, I don't even know sort of what the range of years, the traditional songs you covered, was it, you know, a 400 year period or something or? Some of the material is timeless, really. Uh And nobody knows when it was from. I saw in a book recently, they called them anonymous, which is a good way of putting it, really, when you don't know when, when exactly they were written, but some of them really are timeless. Uh, quite, quite a lot of the songs that we've done over the years have gone back to, what do they say, time immoral? Celtic stuff is, is a bit of a mystery, see? It goes so far back that Samwen, for instance, is a theme anyway. I mean, I wrote that too. It's not traditional. Let's move to that so we can just have yeah. both these things on our plate here, and then we can still talk more about the style and the arrangement and stuff like that. This is still a fairly recent Steel Ice Pan album. 2004, they called her Babylon. Samhain spelled the Samhain. You're saying this text actually is based in something historical. It's become the Christian Halloween, and that has a fixed date, 29th of October every year. It's originally the Feast of the God of Darkness. And one of the interesting lines for me, if I'd known it at the time, I would have used it in the song, The date was always considered to be the date when the veil which fell between life and death was the thinnest. It was at its most transparent. So I'd love that idea. It's a fixed date for a Christian thing called Halloween. But if the pagans, of which I'm for for a while, I was a member of the Carlisle where I live, pagan society. I didn't go that much. It wasn't quite what I expected. But the pagan, uh, because it's not a fixed date, so, and this year I, I just Googled it, and I found out that this year it, the date's the 31st of October and the 1st of November. So it's one day, but it runs across the two because it's not a calendaric thing. It's something that's come from nature that's governed by the moon and that kind of thing. It's been paganized. And it's still quite strong. It's still quite strong, the pagan movement. It gave me a theme because it's a feast of the god of darkness. I thought this is a a good opportunity to get some weighty kind of heavy metal type riffs in. So on a humdrum level, that's partly why I wrote it. But I like the the idea of the festival and all the rest of it. And it's still very much alive in certain places like Glastonbury. You know, I have a a feast and a a dancing and, and merrymaking all based on the in a very serious kind of, I think originally, it's believed that it was just a harvest festival, really. It was to celebrate the the bringing in of the sheaves, as it were, but this is in back in times not recorded.
It's almost two or three totally different songs. You got a lot of key changes in here, but the what you're referring to is heavy metal riffs at the beginning. To me, it sounds more, I guess, yeah, late 60s or gentle giant kind of from the 70s. This, uh, I don't even know what the time signature is. Like, are, were you even thinking in terms of that, or is it just this is how the riff goes? It's singable, but when I was trying to count it out, like, I think there are 19 beats in the first time through, and then there's 17 the second time. I don't know how those are supposed to break down into measures. You had the riff, and then the drummer had to figure out where to put the snares. Yeah, maybe. I think at the time I would have known how it measured out, but I'd have to play it again and probably a few times to get it now. But at the time, it made sense. Yeah. I think it works as a piece, but it seemed to lend itself, all that approach in the arrangement seemed to lend itself to the subject quite well. It was very popular on live things. I just want to use this opportunity, since it's exhibiting such an obvious late 60s 
influence here. So I just read as I was researching for this that you were a member of King Crimson for like, what, a month before you <laughs> joined Steel Ice Band? <laughs> You'll remember a band called America, of course. Yes. I rehearsed with them. I went to see Bowie. I left a person called Michael Chapman following a tour in the States with Cannonball Adderley, strangely enough. Ah, wow. Um, it was only East Coast, so we did New York, Boston, Philadelphia, blah, blah. When I got back, Michael, I think, had had a change of heart about having a band anymore. So I was out of a band, and I went for lots of auditions and knocked on lots of people's doors. And one of them, the only one that I didn't kind of chase them, was Fripp from Crimson, who called me and said, did I want to come and play for a while, see if I'm... And he was very disappointed, and he didn't like the idea of me joining Steel Ice Band. He, he actually said, it's not your kind of band. And he may have been right. <laughs> But yeah, it was an interesting exercise. But I went, I went to play with America, and we played a horse with no name for about an hour and a half, and I got bored, so I went. And Bowie, I was kind of there at the beginning of the Spiders thing, because I lived in Hull just before that, and I knew the people that he eventually took on as the Spiders from us. So I was dotting around looking for a job, basically. That's how I came to be with a few bands for a very short time. Did it take a while after joining Steel Ice Band before you were actually engaging or caught up in the let's do all this historical research to put into our songs? Because it seems that, you know, that was the, the template before you got there. It was quite a long time. I think it was not until I was on the third maybe album. I did a thing called Edwin, which was my, and that was a traditional song. Uh, I think I put a, a different tune to it, but it was a while before I had a crash course when I knew I was going to join Steel Ice but a very kind of well thought of person in traditional music here was the late Peter Bellamy. And he invited me to go and stay with him for a while, which I did in Norwich, in Norfolk. And he kind of introduced me to traditional music in the modern sense. And Steel Ice Band, he knew Peter Knight, and he may have known Maddie and Tim. But anyway, I spent some time with him and learned a little bit. I had learned enough to kind of know that you didn't do certain, you didn't play thirds, for instance, on the bass or anything. You didn't play thirds on anything. But all that changed with the lineup that I I think I'd write in saying that that's where it kind of softened off a bit in the lineup that I joined in 1971. Well, and even in Salon here, just the fact that you're playing that opening riff in unison largely. Yes. It seems like it happens the same way exactly every time. So it's a very precise playing. You know, you could have this same basic riff and if Hendrix was doing it, there would be a lot more blue notes, there would be a lot more kind of things that the individual members would be doing. You still have a, a very Baroque style that's kind of built into this that would not be in King Crimson, say, even though this could definitely be like the opening riff of a King Crimson song. Yes, and it's a very English thing, I think, that kind of playing in unison, fairly fixed, not too much bending notes, not too much off-the-beat stuff. There's no Americana element, if you see what I mean. Well, there is, but it's not as overt as it could be. It's, it's held on to the English modes in a way, I suppose. It's related more to the modes than anything American, I suppose. I mean, I'm digging a, a hole for myself here probably because I don't know much about the folkier side of American music. So I may be wrong. Maybe they are ruled by the modes more than I thought. But it's an English approach. And I think Steel Eye made it a bit of a trademark, really, that unison riff. And it gives a lot more room for the vocals, I guess. So in this, all good seasons, long and good, says the wild man of the wood, that's at least four-part harmony, right? Again, that's another one of those things that Steel Live prided itself with and, and everybody sung on most things at one point or another. So it was a great useful tool to have that scope of the vocals and also have that kind of, I don't know, a, a kind of precision, if you like, I suppose, you know, playing those note for note everybody playing them sometimes riffs. So how does that merge then, though, with the group arrangement approach that, you know, for instance, with these vocals, is it one person? Is it, you know, typically Maddie or whoever was the primary writer in the song or something who's kind of the master of layering the vocals? Or is it more just you add one person and then where's their space left? Okay, somebody else is going to jump on. Peter is going to jump on the low part or what, you know, whatever's open. I think with each lineup, again, the approach was different, but it's always been a trust thing. Peter wrote two things, I think. He wrote Parcel of Rogues, parts for that, which was a traditional Scottish thing. 
Arthur Rowe's wonderful piece, and he wrote the parts for that. And I'm not sure as he didn't write one other, which I can't remember offhand. But mostly because we knew our ranges, and I think with each lineup that would change, of course. Because when Tim left, I found myself singing higher stuff because Tim had a very high voice. I kind of replaced him there. But we'd leave it to whoever was around, as long as you approved, the writer approved. But it was worked out between us, mainly. I mean, had you gotten to the point where with some of the lineups that you could maybe not exactly improvise, but very, very quickly, okay, we've got the lyrics in front of us. And within the space of a couple run throughs, like, yeah, we've got a four part harmony and that sounds reasonably good and, you know, doesn't need much tweaking. Or was it much more deliberate long term planning than that? I think the rehearsal time in the beginning for any tour or for any record was much longer than it became. And it was the thick end of the wedge. And in the end, we were doing things a lot more quickly. I don't know what happens now. It's a bigger band now. There's an extra person in and And they've probably got a completely different way of working. But generally speaking, in the early days, we spent an awful long time working out vocal things as a separate piece. I remember supporting the Beach Boys one night in Denver. And I thought, how similar. I don't mean the sound. I'm not flattering us into the thinking we were like the Beach Boys because we certainly weren't. But I got the same kind of vibe from, I imagine the preparation was similar. They probably had a lot longer in studios than we did. I always imagine Beach Boy harmonies as being very top-down dictated that it's you know Brian Wilson or whoever the producer was telling every, okay, this is your part, this is your part, as opposed to you all with such different voices. I tend to overarrange harmonies myself. And when it gets too much, I refer to them as muppetized. In other words, if, I, if, I, <laughs> if you just really fill it up like the highest thing you can possibly sing or, you know, and the lowest thing, that's a little hard thing to avoid sometimes. <laughs> it's very difficult sometimes to achieve a simplicity which appeals universally, if you like. Like the Beach Boys thing, or we were, Maddie and I were listening to the Everly Brothers last night, and you think, it's just the simplicity sometimes, which is evasive. It's very difficult to kind of achieve that simplicity because there's a natural kind of wanting to make it, I don't know, we, it seems to be a part of the human condition to just want to make it more convoluted and more, we think it equates with interest. It's more interesting if there's more there to listen to. And it's not always the case, is it? You know, I noticed, for instance, on Cromwell Skull here, you know, you've got one violin player, but that definitely toward the end, you know, the reason that can be so long when we get to about five and a half minutes in, the violin is playing a pretty thing. Oh, well, there's another violin playing counter melody. And then it sounds like a whole viola and cello and bass, like an actual arranged. Or was this all just Jesse May Smart layering stuff in the studio? I think it was just Jesse just finding another bit to put across. Yeah, that worked with the one she'd just done. Yes. There weren't any more violin players there. But she can also sound like two people sometimes. Actually, I played with a violinist recently who had a five-string violin, so he could basically do the viola parts with an extra low string. I don't know, I'm just hearing some things that sound lower than I would expect from a violin in that song. No, I know what you mean. I'm not really sure. I Mm -hmm. probably wasn't there at all the stages of it Mm. being put together. So it may well have been done when I wasn't there. So she she probably done stuff that I'm not sure about. Also with that lineup, so you had two guitarists at the time, but Julian Littman is listed as guitar and keyboard. So was he pianoing in this song? And He mainly played keyboards, I think. Okay. So it was Spud Sinclair doing those pretty crazy, by the end, the guitar lines. <laughs> he played on, I don't know, at least three out of my five solo albums. Ah. I've known him for years, and he's just an extraordinary melodic player just beautiful things he's done on some of my things there was a song of called heart of stone and it's still one of my favorite ever guitar solos ever on one of my own things a long time before he joined the band well and the way that that solo progresses at the end of the song that is super melodic and has a whole you know let's just kind of sustain one note for a while but then you know showing that he has the chops kind of introducing that gradually to make it more of a tremolo effect rather than you know it's not eddie van halen coming in but it's got that level of notes per second when it gets down to it by the end and it's all so effortless to him his technique is just superb it's just extraordinary he is an amazing guitar player he's one of the best guitar players i think that i've ever played with and i've played with some seriously good ones i was surprised that you're saying that you don't play bass anymore at all, right? I thought that you were still doing some trio stuff with Ken Nickel and 
Burgess, Nickel and Kemp, is that? The three of us had a few gigs, and Paul's fairly busy with 10cc anyway, mm. and Ken is a kind of more, he's more a solo player most of the time, and i have just gone very quiet, and he moved across country from this side of the country to the other side, so he's kind of, I haven't spoken to him for a while, and he, the last time I spoke to him, he was just off on his annual visit to New Zealand and Australia, so... I haven't heard from him since he moved and I was busy with that. So that band seems to be dormant at the moment. Uh, I'm not anxious to play bass much anymore. We added another two people to that trio. One guy played bass and keyboards. He's doing a bit of work with Maddie now. But he was playing most of the bass actually in the end. And we, and we had a steel player, which was very liberating because it's a lovely blanket instrument, isn't it? I, I love it. I love the noise. That band's gone dormant. I'm not anxious to pick the bass up any more than I have to. I'm struggling with the acoustic a bit, but I've written the song about all the other people who play it much better than me, which makes people laugh. I spent an awful long time in the in the black spotlight, as we call it, behind solo acoustic guitar players. You know, I've often been the only other person on the stage. You know, some really good players. I just wanted to be one of them. <laughs> I'm a lot better after the three and a half years of struggling, but I'm still not in the league of some of the better ones. I just like doing it on my own, and I like telling the stories. So that's half of it almost. I like singing my own songs, but I like telling the stories about the bands and the the stuff over the years. I've got a lot of stories, you know. Some of that includes the historical stories, right? Like you were saying yeah. that, okay, you're actually giving the whole Cromwell Skull narrative in the performance to make that. I like that idea, especially with a solo performer. I was reading David Byrne's book on how music is made and was, you know, the reason that they use such elaborate stage techniques. Like, I mean, now he's doing this whole, everybody in the band is mobile. You can find a clip with them on Stephen Colbert with basically making a full band into a marching band because he just felt like there's something, the way that the human sensibilities work is that you're not going to find 40 minutes of just watching four people or one person definitely stand and play songs. Like that's the way we think of it as performers, but to actually get in the mind of the amount of stimuli that people need to keep them interested. So I think if you're going to do solo, you know, stopping and telling a story for half, you know, it's definitely a great way to to engage more parts of the brain than and give people a, a rest. Absolutely. And, and it does explain partly why you're doing it and how you did it and where it came from, why you ended up singing these songs and all those kind of funny things about the back room stuff, which possibly most people don't know about. And, and the thing is, David Burns' idea has also, we've been doing this a long time, all of us, haven't we? And I think that people now, especially with the speed of communications and the, the absolute glut of material available to all of us, demands almost that we do something different. It's not good enough anymore just to do the one thing for too long anyway. Uh, if you're going to see somebody for a whole night, you're paying a lot for a ticket now, and they do a little something more than one, unless you're Bob Dylan. If you're Bob Dylan, you're good enough and you're, your reputation is such that you could watch him, he's probably mesmerizing. I've never actually seen him, but I would imagine that I would enjoy any amount of him. I've never actually seen him live other than, you know, on video before myself, but I've just heard lots of things in terms of his, what would be interpreted as very poor. In fact, my father came up, who's a folk singer in the early 60s and was kind of appalled by the Bob Dylan ethic of like, he wouldn't look at the audience. He just kind of was, you know, had that rock star swagger that my dad was of the previous, you know, the more Harry Belafonte generation of folk singers. It was anathema to them, yes. Well, I remember myself. I remember feeling a bit like that myself at the beginning. I thought, well, this bloke can't even sing. And of course, he can, he can sing very well. But it wasn't the kind of singing that was kind of acceptable at the time, I suppose, to people oh, my age, I suppose. Yeah. Was there still that feeling, I guess, by the time you were in Steel Eye, that there wasn't the feeling that my dad, when he was doing his sets in the 60s, they would tell jokes. It was, you know, he performed with the Smothers Brothers, like on that, and Pat Paul, like that was the kind of ethic that was where American folk music was at, was that exactly like we're talking about stopping and telling stories, incorporate comedy. 
Was there still any of that lingering in what you guys were doing as folk or was it, no, this is a folk flavor of rock, not a something connected to that old tradition, you know, 1960s performing? In the tradition, there are some very comical stories, Mm -hmm. but I don't suppose it's got the same kind of atmosphere comedically as as what we're talking about, really. But it was also a fairly lively band. We did lots of theatrical things. In fact, we worked on a couple of plays live. We did Kidnap, Robert Louis Stevenson's Kidnap. It was the first job I did when I joined them at the Edinburgh Lyceum Theatre. So, and they'd already done a stage thing before that, Corona, which was about the, the wars, the Spanish accession, I think. When we did more later, and we used to do a thing called This A Neat, which is one of those timeless ancient things where we I remember us going on in New York and people ran out scared and then at the end the promoter said well it's okay everybody in here is taking Boone's Wine and Downers and they were waiting to see Proko Haram we were supporting Proko Haram and we had these kind of pagan dress stuff on and the lights were dim it's a very striking piece which is just unaccompanied voices (laughs) and people were actually leaving in a hurry Wow, that is the 70s. Yep, you could be be quite a bit more theatrical. Yeah, we were quite a theatrical band. So, in fact, I remember doing a set at the one that burned down in Los Angeles, um, the Ash Grove. And we did a set at the Ash Grove with no music in it at all. But we were there for a week, I think, doing two shows a night. And there was one of them, one of those said, and in fact, the crickets, Buddy Holly's crickets came to see us, which was absolutely enthralling for us. We, that was amazing because we'd done Rave On before I joined the band. They'd done Rave On. So they always wanted to meet and years went by and finally we got to meet them at the Ash Grove. We did a set without any music at all. Don't ask me why. We just said we'd go on and wing it and see what happened. I think it was okay. <laughs> Let's have you put your storyteller hat on one more time to introduce our last song. So we're just going to say a few words about this and say goodbye. We wanted to actually choose something from the classical period of the band from 1975's All Around My Hat, Bachelor's Hall. Produced by Mike Bat, who here is better known for producing a band called The Wombles, which is just a bunch of people in suits uh, of these creatures called Wombles. But he's an amazing musician and a great producer, and he decided that he would dress it up a bit with orchestral backing and, and arrangement. I like it. I, I'm quite pleased with how it came out. Do you want to tell us a little of the, the actual historical story or whatever that you were pulling on for this? This is a, is this a historical text that you just set to music? This is one that I think has it supposed to be. Uh, and it's just extolling the life of a bachelor and don't get married <laughs> uh-huh. is what it's saying. And it's one of the examples of the kind of comedic side of the tradition. Well, that's great to then combine that with a, a giant production. <laughs> yeah, well, he, he saw it like that. And, and who were we to argue? Well, thank you so much for doing this. My pleasure. Thanks for having me, Mark. All right, here's Bachelor Hall.
Thanks to Rick. So this makes Steel I Span along with King Crimson and Genesis, XTC, Bauhaus slash Love and Rockets, and Green on Red, and Camper Van Beethoven. I think those are all the bands that I've had more than one member on from, but I'm probably forgetting something. I guess I've had multiple touring members of REM, but no REM has been played on this podcast. And I know I've had a couple instances where two members of the same band insist on coming on with me together. And I guess I could have done that this time because Maddie Pryor was living right there with Rick Camp. But hopefully I'll get to talk to her on a future occasion. Again, you can find more of Rick's work at rickcamp.co.uk. And to find more about this podcast, go to nakedlyexaminedmusic.com. Please subscribe directly to the Nakedly Examined Music feed if you are not already. And you'll be sure to receive all the new episodes in a timely fashion. The next one being with Alev Lenz whose voice you'll recognize if you've seen the Netflix German sci-fi TV show Dark. She did the theme for that. Also a song for Black Mirror. That is a really, really interesting conversation. You should definitely check that out. This has been a very busy podcasting week for me. I will have recorded by the end of tomorrow five podcasts in the same week. Crazy. Two of those being pretty much pop episodes, two nakedly examined musics. The most recent ones I have done were with Katie Jane Garside. She was the original singer for Daisy Chainsaw, if that means anything to you. Super interesting lady. And then I engaged in a little bit of self-indulgence and actually talked to one of my former bandmates, Matt Ackerman, about music that we worked on together between 2007 and 2013 in a band called New People. I had just put all those albums newly on marklint.bandcamp.com. And wanted to have a general discussion about collaborating with another singer-songwriter. And I think you're going to enjoy that one. Jeez, awful things upon awful things in the news. I hope you're all keeping safe, being creative, write a protest song, something. Just keep on musicking. Until next time, this is Mark Lintzenmeyer signing off. <laughs>